Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship at St. Paul Lutheran, whether you are a member of this congregation or if you are visiting this morning, we're glad to have you. Um, Just as it is with many things, we can sometimes take for granted all of God's blessings that we receive from day to day, uh, even from second to second, if you think about it. Uh, One of those gifts is actually proclaiming God's word for people around us. And here we are doing exactly that, uh, proclaiming God's word. Uh, I know many of you are in dialogue with the name of the Lord that you've been given throughout the week. And here we get to express this out loud. And it's just a treasure. And it continues to be a treasure uh, to be a member of this congregation. And I sure hope that you can feel the same thing. This is a place where we can receive God's word and and respond in prayer and praise and and fellowship with one another because of that good word that we receive. Uh, So, man, did I really go off there? Uh, It is is Holy Trinity Sunday, so uh, the Trinity is kind of the doctrine that we use to describe the name of the Lord. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is that name. Uh, the Holy Trinity would be the way we describe it in uh, theological or doctrinal conversation. But uh, some of the songs that we'll sing and the scriptures that we read will go toward that end of expressing this uh, name of God uh, that we know that is one, three in one, one in three. Uh, uh, so this is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that's today. Um, and we'll have several readings, of course, and, and some songs and, and some things that we hope will benefit all of you during worship this morning. Uh, please check the bulletin for announcements. Uh, hopefully those made it to the bulletin this week and, and, uh, and that that can be shared and hope, hope you have a good week moving forward. Uh, but this morning we will worship and uh, we'll begin with the call to worship. Uh, Please rise if you're able to. We gather under the sign of the cross and in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Let us call upon the triune God. Let us call upon the triune God. Let us call upon the triune God. Holy Trinity, all that is, all that was and all that ever will be. Amen. Our opening hymn is O Day of Rest and Gladness, 251 in the Green Hymnal.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Beloved in the Lord, God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and the truth is not in us. But if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus washes away all our sin. Let us confess our faults to God, knowing that He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God who knows us, you have shown us what is good, but we have looked to other lights to find our way. We have not been just in our dealings with others. We have chosen revenge over mercy. We have promoted ourselves instead of walking humbly with you. Forgive us our sins and show us your salvation. In the face of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. People of God, you have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, poured out for you in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Hear the promise first given to you in baptism. You are God's child. Your sins are forgiven. Rejoice and be glad, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Majestic Trinity, mystery of three in one and one in three, we worship you. Before time, your love burst forth, creating the world in which you took delight. Strengthen us in our faith, defend us from all evil and temptation, and bring us into the everlasting presence of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may now be seated. Uh, Kids, come on up for the children's chat. Good morning. Hey guys. Uh, so uh, I'm wondering, I've probably asked you this before, but is there anything you're thankful for today? Sometimes it's fun, and I would encourage you this summer to once in a while take a moment, take a deep breath amidst all that playing to reflect and say, hmm, what am I thankful for today? Does anything come to your mind? Anything from this past week? Anything that you're looking forward to? I can wait for you. You can think really hard right now. I know one thing that I would be thankful for if I was you. It's summer. Pool time, baby. Do you want to go to the pool? Do you want to play outside in this nice weather? Anything else that you could be thankful for? Huh? Shelter. Yeah, shelter. That's a good thing. We don't always think of that, do we? Sometimes we take things for granted. Even this morning, we didn't have power. I'm sure this was true for many people here. Uh, No electricity. So we kind of thought, what do we do now? How do I cook my breakfast? Uh, How are we going to have a church service this morning? But we take this for granted. It got fixed. That's pretty cool. I'm thankful for that. Anything else? Friends, yeah. Anybody else that you're thankful for? 
Kitty. It's a good name for a cat right there, Kitty. Yeah, pets. Maybe your family. A your cat is named Luna. Luna, that's the real name. That's right. You just call her Kitty. So, yeah, there's a lot to be thankful for. And I know someone out there, your parents, your grandparents are so thankful to, to have you guys. Some of their, the most things that are, th- they're, or the things that they're most thankful for are when they hear you say, hey, mom, watch this. And then you do your thing, and then you look back at them, and you can see the smile on your face. Man, parents just love that. So do grandparents. As long as the watch this doesn't, isn't followed by something that you got hurt doing, which happens sometimes. Now think of all these blessings. Where do they come from? All these things that we can be thankful for, shelter, food. We didn't even talk about food. Oh, Where do these things come from? Jesus. We can say God. God created this, and all three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, were there to create everything in this world, everything in it, including the things we're most thankful for, you. So God created this, so you can take a moment. Now, how did God create all of this? I mean, that's quite the engineering and the chemistry and the... Yeah, if the batteries were dead, like, how does this work? Yeah? How did God create the world and everything in it? All right, we're going to read Genesis 1. Just in a moment here. And I want you to hear how many times Genesis, the very beginning of the Bible, says, and God said. It's like 10 times or more. And guess what happened? After God speaks, there it is. God creates by speaking. Now, that's not only true at the very beginning of the world and the universe and everything in it, but that's true today. And he sends you his word, and it creates faith. What do we have? Our faith isn't in anything unless it's a word that's being spoken. And God makes this faith faith as a gift to you. So you can be thankful for the food and the shelter and the people in your life. And you can also be thankful that God is a creating God. He is very creative. And he even creates faith in you. And that is the most real thing ever. Okay, so we can be thankful for all of that. Let us pray here. You, you can repeat after me. Dear Lord, we thank you for creating the world and everything in it, including me, with your word. Amen. All right. can open your your pew bible to page 1 if you want to follow In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth Now the earth was formless and empty darkness was over the surface of the deep And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. 
And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living and moving thing with which the water teems, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it. I give every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. 
And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. We'll do the responsive reading. Psalm 8, and I'll begin with verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how, ma how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, what is man that you are mindful of him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. You made him rule over the works of your hands. All flocks and herds, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, O oh Lord, our Lord, how is your name all the earth. Okay, our second reading can be found on 1692 if you want to follow along. It starts with Acts 2, 14a, and then it skips to uh, verse 22. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Here ends the reading of the second reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Glory. 
Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what is church about? What are we doing here? Let's say you get a new neighbor that moves in across the street from you this summer, and they ask you what your church is all about. How do we answer that question? We tend to make the answer somewhat complicated. We might list some of these things. Uh, We've got a lot of young families, an active youth group, fun stuff happening on Wednesday nights occasionally, Uh, some strong, uh, super strong Bible studies and small groups, some really nice facilities out here in the beautiful country and a a beautiful cemetery, active membership, good numbers in attendance, and also a bright financial outlook. A pastor who does a good job, or a fine job, or an okay job. We've got the right kind of music as well, and it's done well. Now, these are all good things, of course really good things. They can serve the main mission, the main thing, quite well. But they in themselves are all secondary things that tend to become primary. Background things that want to become center stage for this church thing. The other stuff in many churches tends to become the main thing. Accessories becoming the main outfit, the side dishes dominating the entree, the medium replacing the actual message that we have. But truly, it's one thing. What is church about? There's one mission. It's one thing that makes, defines, and identifies the church. One thing. And it's the gospel, delivered and heard, making Christ known, preaching Christ and him crucified as the Apostle Paul would say it, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is making God's name and his mercy known. So church can be spoken of as the mouth house for God's promises. The gospel, the forgiveness of sins. This is the work of Jesus Christ. And that is the only thing we've been given that makes us any different from Kiwanis or Lions Club or a dinner group or a political action committee, one thing that makes the church the gospel proclaimed to those in need of it, giving Jesus Christ and his mercy in word and sacrament. One thing, the gospel. And here in our reading, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus Christ. So, We give his word, his authoritative, creative word to others. We disciple them by baptizing them in God's name. 
all three persons in the one God do this. The Father speaks. Jesus Christ is the word spoken. And the Holy Spirit creates faith in that word. That's it. Doctrine now calls that trinity. But God's name itself is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then the question becomes, okay, but who is this name supposed to reach? Who is included here? Who do we give this promise to? Who do we baptize? Who is supposed to receive God's name and his promise? All nations, right? The people out there need it. There are those in this world who don't know the name of God. In the far reaches of the earth, they need this name out there. And then there are those out there who have only heard the name of Jesus when it's used in profanity, when it's used in anger. They don't know the name nor they, do they know the story of Christ. This one might have a vague sense about Jesus, but no relationship. No idea that what Jesus did was done for the sake of saving him or her. He or she might not know what the promise is, or that it is indeed for him or her. And then there are those out there who left the church in anger. They got mad at the pastor or the council, mad about the music or the worship style maybe, and in anger they left. And they figured, I don't need a relationship with the church to have a relationship with God. There are those out there like this who then, without a word from the outside, without a word that gets to them again and again, start to believe that God is one that they make up. The God of his or her own invention. A God who is bound to be the God the way she wants him to be God. Primarily, to make hard demands of her enemies and exudes only cuddly kindness to her. Now some left the church in shame. They're out there. Something bad happened. They think it's their fault. Maybe it was. They looked around the church and thought, well, their family isn't a broken mess like mine is. That guy isn't falling apart like I am. Or she's not addicted like me. Well, they're not broke. I'm not sure if I am good enough to be here. So maybe I'll just stay away. Or they start to go to a church that supposedly equips them with the tools and skills needed to deal with it, to deal with the shame, instead of a church that preaches Christ who takes all the shame from you. Churches that can give the you-can-do-better sermon instead of the this-is-what-Christ-has-done one. Now some out there left the church in a slow drift. One weekend of youth sports turned into seven. Unpleasant weather got in the way, or even those nice weather weekends at the lake. Or things got busy. They needed rest and less pressure. They might say, yeah, that's my church but I haven't been there for a few years. They drift away far enough eventually that they can't see the shore anymore. And when we have a culture that says, you don't need Christ, 
You don't have a reason to really feel shame. But there are other solutions for this despair that you're in. Well, why go then? Just keep treading, drifting, wandering. Well, our gospel mission is for them too, huh? And some will even come back, and we might even jump on the opportunity that this is. We might say that something that is very true. I'm so glad that you're back which is, by the way, often the last thing that those who had been drifting indifferently in shame or in anger want to hear. And they respond, Oh, I was hoping you wouldn't notice. Well, this mission is for all of these people and all of the nations. So we give them the name of Christ We bestow the gifts through the one thing that claims, gathers, enlightens, and keeps them. And this is the word of Christ. But I forgot something. I forgot something. We've got a list of people who out there who need the gospel. But I forgot someone. They're not out there at all. They're right here. It's you. It's me. Many of you who gather here week after week, even described as the most active in the ministries of our church body, you people who have been baptized and received the gospel relatively often, you, just as desperately, need to hear the promises of Christ. So, let's say it is you, and you are the lucky ones in here, in here, to receive, the, and you actually receive this promise spoken, that your sins have been forgiven, this real word coming from God, and you've been made right with Him. And you hear this good news that there's nothing left for you to make yourself right with God, nothing left for you to enact when you've already received the victory of Christ and his gift of salvation. And then you walk out. And the world will try to take that gift away from you. Or even before you walk out, perhaps during a prayer or a hymn, you start to wonder, nothing left for me to do? Well, Nothing else in the entire world works like that. I mean, if I don't show up for work, I don't get paid. A student doesn't turn anything in and bombs the test, there's an F going on that report card. If I'm not a good parent, my kids are going to grow up and never visit me ever again. Can this promise of God really really be like this? Can it be true? And is that really for me? Well, that sounds an awful lot like verse 17 here in our gospel reading. Some worshipped him there on the mountain, but some, even with the risen Christ in their sights, they doubted. We Christians are both camps, saints and sinners, At the same time, this is our Christian life. The reality is that just as soon as we have the promise, it's attacked. You're always, we could say, one day away from being an unbeliever. Your soul is an active battlefield, a battle to the death within each one of us. Those, both for those who drift away from the church and for those inside the walls right now. Me too. You and I need this gospel. The entire world needs this word of Christ. We never reach the point where the main thing doesn't need to be proclaimed anymore. As if we're ready to move on to some of the other stuff. As if we could say, okay, I get it now. Yeah, 
enough of this Christ and his mercy for me. The mission remains the same, and it is the gospel. It is the beginning, middle, and end of your Christian life. And the gospel is not of this world, but God creates it, and he brings it to you. He gives you his name. This is what the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit does for you, and I get to announce this. I announce right now his forgiveness of your sins. And it's not for my sake. It was not my idea. Nor was it delivered under my authority. But for the sake and by the authority of Christ. You need this. He says so. He's in the business of making you right. So he speaks. He gives you his name. He then gives you the keys to give his name to others and says, baptize them. Tell them about me, Christ says. And as you go, I'll be with you. Always to the end of the age. While you go, I'm going to be pouring out grace, blessing you, uplifting you, recreating you, as you go through this world and an uncertain future, when you're scared to death, drifting, or kicking and screaming, I'm bringing the new day for you. My word for you is certain. And when I bring you to me, you're going to stretch out and say, this looks good, Lord. This looks good. And God is with you to the end of the age. You can count on him always. Amen. You may remain seated now as we sing our hymn of the day. It is 400 in the green hymnal. God whose almighty word. Let us join together in confessing the words of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Holy Trinity, you have revealed yourself as one God in three persons. We praise you for the wonders of your, of your creation, knowing it is you that we belong. We thank you for coming to us in Christ to redeem us from all that holds us bound. We pray that you would be at work through your word so that we would acknowledge and honor you in all that we do. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, your son prayed that we may be protected in your name. Protect us today from all calamities and distresses that may befall people in our world, in our nation, in our communities, and in our lives. Please give comfort to Dylan Anderson and his family for his upcoming surgery on Friday. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal God, you are victorious over sin, death, and all that separates us from you. Draw near to all who feel alone in illness or suffering, especially for Brent and Starla de Groot and other people and relatives and friends as they mourn the loss of Starla's father, Ron Tekken, and Brent's mother, Levon. Fill them with your heavenly presence. Lord, in your mercy, Almighty Lord, give us rest and regeneration in your word that has claimed us once and for all. Help us to hear and know you so that we might be renewed for work in your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary. For in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and poured it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and all people for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All who are baptized have been instructed properly and trust God's word are welcome to the Lord's Supper, where our Lord is truly present offering his gifts of forgiveness and eternal life. The gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all is ready. You may be seated.